Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Incomplete Skeptic Sober Wise Guy series. Here we explore marginalized ideas and the people behind them. Since we'll be talking about prisons and corrections today, it follows to say that both I and my guest are ex-convicts, and we're both in recovery from substance abuse. But we are more than our mugshots. Dan is my guest, and he is a member of the Minnesota Corrections Association Full Circle Advisory Boards, a lot of words. But we're a bunch of ex-convicts who serve the MCA to bring our experience, strength, and hope to those affected by incarceration. Dan Holt wears many, many hats through the years. He is um, sober for 52 years. And that's why I wanted him on Sober Wise Guy. We interview people sober 30 30 years or more. And that's our central focus of why a person stays in recovery after so many years. Um, Dan Kane, welcome to the Sober Wise Guy series. Thank you. Happy to be here. Certainly my privilege, and I hope people get some uh, some life lessons out of where we're going today. So we just get right to it. Where... Um, what did you used to be like? What happened? And what are you like now? Well, for a number of years, I was a <clears throat> active heroin addict. Um, I used multiple kinds of drugs and had been in the Marine Corps for a while. But when I got out, I caught up with the people that I had used with before and they had moved on. So I moved on with them. And, uh, you know, was basically a thief and a, a drug addict, um, you know, stealing to support my habit most of the time. But, you know, I, I always say it's questionable what, what came first, the chicken or, chicken or the egg. You know, I was um, certainly not, ex not a pro-social person before I started using heroin and much less so afterwards. And uh, went through treatment uh, six times total, um, twice on methadone. And uh, in 1972, uh, coming out of prison in St. Cloud, I went directly into a program called Eden House and have been sober ever since. Um, I uh, was given a lot of opportunities throughout my recovery um, started a program in Milwaukee with some people from the East Coast Im immediately out of treatment. That was before you needed to be a, a licensed counselor. Um, didn't exactly gel with their philosophy and came back to Minnesota. I volunteered in the program that I completed, uh, ultimately became a counselor, a senior counselor, a program director, and ultimately the executive director of the program. Um, also was, uh, as in my recovery, became friends with a lot of people that normally wouldn't have even looked twice at me. And uh, as a result, um, became chair of the Sentencing Guidelines Commission in its early stages uh, in 1980. Two, I believe, and I served in that capacity till 1990. Um, and, uh, you know, had the occasion to uh, do other things, develop the program, merge the substance abuse program with the correctional program, reentry services to form an organization called RS Eden in the year 2000. Um, was invited to speak at the White House Council for a Drug-Free America in, I think, 1986 or seven. Um, you know, chaired the group that lobbied for counselor licensure and then chaired the first licensing board. Um, and, uh, you know, took the program into the affordable housing arena and helped uh, develop over 500 units of sober supportive housing. Uh, I retired in the year 2000. Um, I might also add that I got a pardon 
in 1978. Um, and so, you know, if somebody asked me if I have a criminal record, I can legally say no, but, uh, you know, why? I mean, it's part of who I am. It's uh, people become the sum total of their experiences. So it's a big part of my experience. And uh, I've never tried to hide it, uh, you know, largely for the express reason that if somebody else can say if that jerk can make it, anybody can make it. And, uh, you know, why would I withhold that from people that are experiencing the same kinds of things that I experienced before I got sober? And, uh, you know, became involved with uh, corrections, uh, you know, er early on in terms of my own incarceration, once in Texas, once in Minnesota. And then uh, became involved with MCA and felt as though that, you know, there was a, a, a voice that was missing in terms of the development of policy and and procedures in the system. and help to organize the, the the group that we talked about that uh, are ex-offenders who've been successful in the community and hopefully lend their voice uh, having the correctional experience that you know most policymakers don't have and certainly uh, most correctional people have don't have uh, except from the other side and uh, you know help to influence the direction the corrections go in this state. I've been retired, as I said, since uh, the year 2020. And, but I continue to do a group with people who committed homicide, who have been released in the community after completing their sentence. We call it the lifer group. And uh, that's what I do now, other than be retired and sit on the porch with my dog and smoke cigars and go to the cabin and shoot deer. So that's who I am. I wonder if it's legal to shoot deer in our backyard here. We see a lot of them go by. Probably, probably not. Probably not. No, nope, I don't I don't have a gun anyway, but um but I could get a bow and arrow. Yeah. Anyway, you know, even if it was to live, I wouldn't so anyway, I digress far too easily. Um, so I think people might be curious about the lifers group, just the dynamics of it. What, um, what it is, what is it that you're trying to accomplish with? Uh, I assume these are the the men that are lifers. Well, it's it's men, but it's not exclusive to men. That if women want to be involved, it's. It's limited to people who've been convicted of some kind of homicide who have served at least 15 or 16 years in prison. So there are second degree as well as first degree people there. And, you know, it started, I had a very close friend uh, from childhood who died when he was 71, several years back, uh, who had been involved in the system since he was 12 years old. When he died at 71, he had a total of 42 years in prison. Mm -hmm. And he got paroled from his life sentence and then had to serve another six years for a couple of assaults and came out into the community. And just realizing the challenges that he had in coming into a world that he didn't know uh, with things like uh, light rail and cars that talk to you and, uh, you know, just the evolution of the world while he'd been locked up, we got to talking and, and said, you know, you know, it'd be nice if we set up something that could help prepare people when they got out for the world that they're entering and to do so and in, in maintain pro-social values and, and uh, behaviors and uh, help them, you know, put together a life. Some of them as old as in their 60s, and, you know, early 60s, mid 60s. And so we started this group and I went to corrections and I said, just when Tom Roy was commissioner, I said, we're going to start a group for lifers in the community. And he said, well, we're going to do that. And I said, yeah, well, 
it'll, it'll take you three years to do it with all the you know bullshit that you have to go through in policy making and i can do it this weekend and he said well you know great can we pay you for it and i said no uh, because if you pay me for it then you'll make me take you know attendance and you'll you know order people to come to the program and or to the, the group and you know i really don't want those people in group anyhow i want people that want to change that 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 want to you know put their lives together and they said, well, can, can uh, we send a correctional officer there? And I said, uh, no, because. They're always looking for a back door, eh? <laughs> they're always going to, they're always going to be a correctional mm -hmm. officer. Mm -hmm. And I said, if somebody's going to hurt somebody or becomes problematic, I said, I'll stop them. And, and if I can't stop them on my own, uh, I'll ask for help. But until that time, it's confidential. And to their credit, uh, the corrections department said go for it and oh, good. you know it's been 12 13 years now and uh, we have yet to have anybody convicted of a new crime other than a uh, basically petty theft crime that one person has violated for we have had people violated for um you know things like a, a dirty ua or a uh, you know, some other violation of their parole conditions. But, um, you know, and the thing for me that is so exciting is, you know, I've worked with uh, drug addicts and criminals my entire life. And if you're, if you, if you're a heroin addict, put a bunch of heroin addicts in the room, a bunch of burglars in the room, and you put a bag over their head, you can't tell one from the other. But when you're dealing with people who committed a crime a homicide uh it's a very diverse group you have people like my friend jerry who you know who as i said did 42 or 71 years in prison who were very very uh, criminally oriented and uh, you know all the way to one guy that came out after serving time for murder and he was a farmer from southern minnesota and very close to his father, and yet his father was very domineering. And the bankers came to foreclose on his farm, and his father told him to shoot one, and he did. And that was the only crime he ever committed in his life. So, you know, you, you had a variety of things, everything from uh, people who were uh, pathologically inclined towards criminal behavior to people for whom the murder that they had was the only crime that they'd ever committed. And it's been a fascinating experience. We've been blessed in that, you know, we've had a great deal of success with some people. And, you know, logical outcome of that was to get their input into the things that DOC was proposing because they'd been through most programs, those that had been successful, those that hadn't, they'd, they'd made their way through reentry and and uh, were successful at that. And they, 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 they had a frame of reference that you couldn't duplicate. That, um, you know, I mean, politicians tend to think that, you know, everybody shares their worldview and the things that motivate and deter them would motivate and deter other kinds of people and nothing could be further from the truth. So, you know, having that voice in, in, in the policy discussions, uh, to me was critical. And as I said, that's been going now for a couple of years, it's still in the development stage. Um, but it's getting more and more credibility in that, you know, we're being asked our opinion on things. We've met a couple times with the Commissioner of Corrections on, <clears throat> on this new program that they're instituting called the MRRA, which allows people to get a time cut for certain behavior in the institutions and attitude changes and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, it's my hope that, that you know, long term we can change the culture. Uh, to where, you know, we're looked upon as 
a valuable resource to the department in terms of how it plans for the future. Yeah, I think it's key to have humility and responsibility in balance, you know, and and whether it's for the staff or for the prisoners, um, you know, there's a law of prison that nobody comes out the way they went in. And I don't care if you work there for a day or a lifetime, or if you've done one year or if you've done, you know, 42, <laughs> you know, and I, I got to say that I've seen only a couple of people um, that I thought were never going to change. And Jerry was one of them. And to see him free and sitting with a group of guys that are like sitting in freedom and doing the deal, I was like shocked. I was I was at RS Eden one one time to speak and I saw Jerry there. It's like, what? You know? And I just had to say it out loud. I just said, Jerry, I thought you were one of the guys that would never change ever. And I don't think that about people generally. It's really hard for me to think that, you know. And um, but people proving those of us that are a little cynical about such things, um, you know, it's it's really cool and we can prove somebody wrong, you know. And um and we want to be proven wrong about such things. So, but I, I, I remember the chief psychologist of the Oak Park Heights prison when he said that it was a foregone conclusion that Timothy Cameron would spend the rest of his life in prison. And I know you, you know the story, but I'll say it in case people here probably could use to hear such thing. But, um, you know, he was wrong. And... Um, it doesn't mean that I couldn't do something stupid again, but, but since I'm in recovery, the likelihood of my doing something stupid again is, is really unlikely, you know, and um, even though I still, I don't know about you, but I get angry sometimes, but I don't act on it, and I think if I was using, God only knows what's going to happen, you know. But um, I've got my power under control if I'm sober. But as soon as I put a drink in me, you know, I'm I'm either going to end up in in prison, uh, dead, or in a nut house. And um, so sobriety, you know, it, it did a lot for me. And um, and they have a saying is that you can always tell an alcoholic you can't tell them much. And if an ex-convict doesn't fit into that paradigm, I don't know who does because we have authority issues, you know. And um, um, but I think healing from the authority issues is what trust from people in the system has helped afford for me, you know. And um, you're both an ex-convict and you're kind of in the system, not as a classical way I would view it, view it. but um, I've met a lot of people in, in the prison system that really want us to put a good life together. They actually care about us as human beings, and I never knew that until I sobered up. I never knew that until I started living a different kind of a life and and i put my my glasses on that helped me see reality called sobriety glasses and um and as i even started meeting cops who who cared who weren't liars who weren't going to beat me you know it's like i didn't know there was good cops out there and there are good cops out there and, and to me a good cop is one that doesn't let bad ones get away with stuff no that's you know that's a good cop and I've met him. And um, but how do you how do you maintain your sense of integrity and hope and um, uh, sarcasm through through positivity or however you want to put this? Uh, and I say this, folks, because I I consider Dan like the the chief psychologist of the psychology department, you know. Uh, psychology department. If we can merge psychology and sarcasm into one word, I don't know what that would be other than Dan Kane. <laughs> well, you know, I think there's something when, when you talked about gaining sobriety, 
there's a difference between sobriety and recovery. And unfortunately, uh, not everybody recognizes that. And not everybody, even in programs, works towards that. But when you're using, uh, especially, you know, when you're using illegal drugs and involved in that illegal lifestyle, you have a, a you have uh, antisocial values and, and uh, you know, you become very, you know, self-centered and, and, you know, life revolves around where you're going to get the next fix from. And, you know, recovery is something that begins with sobriety. You know, it involves a change of attitude. It involves a change of values. It involves, um, doing things in a different way um it, and, and it doesn't always involve as you pointed out when you talked about getting angry it doesn't always involve changing your inclinations but it involves changing your behavior you know i tell people i walk into a, a gas station and <clears throat> and buy a a candy bar or something and hand them a, a, a ten dollar bill and they hand me $19 and change. And I turn around and I, I, I think, well, shoot, my first inclination is I just made 10 bucks for doing nothing. But then I, I realized that, you know, one way or another, I'm going to pay for that 10 bucks in a way that uh, I don't want to have happen. And I may not be able to draw a line between that behavior and the consequences. But nonetheless, I give the $10 back. And oftentimes the cashier looks at me like, what are you crazy? And, um, you know, just that reaction is worth more than 10 bucks to me. But it's 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 knowing what to do and making a decision to do it. I mean, if I took an MMPI today, it wouldn't peak it as high as it did back 52 years ago, but it would probably still peak in the same directions. It's just that I know I don't have to act on it and, and I don't because I'm motivated by the fact that I know that I'll pay one way or another if I start easing up on, on the values that, that I know make me successful. And, uh, and, and it, it, whatever advantage I get out of, out of being, you know, greedy or self-serving or whatever, uh, is offset by the consequences that will come later. I mean, you can call it karma, you can call it whatever you want, but, um, you know, when you do good, you attract good people, um, you know, you, you feel better and you do better. And it's not a one-for-one one trade. I mean, you know, by giving back to 10 bucks, I'm, doesn't mean I'm going to win the lottery tomorrow. But, uh, and it doesn't mean that I won't have problems, but it does mean that I won't have problems of my making. And uh, that's, you know, that the, the, if, if you can get to the point where you realize that and you act accordingly, you know, you get a sense of peace and, uh, uh, and confidence. And, you know, I mean, I, like I said, I've been given a lot of opportunities that, that you know, that I never thought I could, you know, uh, get. And as luck would have it, I was in a position where I could take advantage of them. But, um, you know, back in the day, I mean, I always knew that I, you know, had a certain amount of intelligence and I could sit back and I could say that, you know, if I didn't have this needle in my arm, I could be, you know, my probation officer or executive or vice president or president of the United States. Well, as long as I kept the needle in my arm, I never had to prove that. And taking the needle out of the arm and and feeling getting the opportunity to show what I could do, um, I could prove not only to the world but to myself that I wasn't a piece of shit. And uh, that was that was a, a revelation, you know, an epiphany, if you will, that uh, you know, hey, it doesn't have to be like this. And uh, and this is a whole lot better and you're I'm a whole lot happier and a whole lot more stable. And, you know, I've, I've put together a life that I never could have imagined. I've got my own house, uh, 
up until I got too old to ride it. I had a motorcycle. I've got a dog. I've got children. I've got grandchildren. Uh, I'm comfortable. I'm retired. Uh, sometimes I get bored being retired, but nonetheless, um, you know, I never expected to live beyond 25 years old. And and I had people around me, and you mentioned cops. I had cops around me who predicted that I wouldn't live past 25 years old. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to sound maudlin, but <laughs> they're all dead. And, yeah, uh, right, and you're alive. You got it. <laughs> Yeah. You know, well, we gave, we've given people a reason to be skeptical about us too. Oh yeah, we have. <laughs> but I think uh, I I think you know, I mean, especially with the lifers, you know, I I tell them, you know, there will always be people who will judge you by the worst moment that you had in your life, and you know, and and the thing that makes you different from other people, you know, other than the fact that they might not have gone as far as you did in the worst moment is the fact that you got caught because very few of us could survive being judged by the worst person we were at singular moment and uh you know you have to you have to first off stop seeing yourself as that and eventually um other people stop seeing you as that you know as i said i mean orville pung who was in, in my mind the the greatest commissioner we've ever had for corrections in this state said to me one time, he said, why do you still tell people that you're a, a criminal and an addict? You're so far from that now. And, and I say, because, you know, I want people to know that, you know, I wasn't any smarter, any better looking, any more charismatic than the people that I shot dope with. You know, I got opportunities. And I want people to know that if I can make it, anybody can make it. No, uh, no speech rises above the person that listens to it. And um, so, you know, we hear what we hear when we're ready to hear it. And I think when uh, ex-cons step up and talk to ex-cons, they're a little more willing to hear it because they see somebody that is it's like, oh, you, used, you were like me. You know, you've gone through some of the same things that, that I have or I am going through. And, um, you know, it, it's like when I was a caseworker at a place called 180 Degrees. And one of the lifers that you um, talked to, he was um, he was on my caseload. And, you know, I gave him hope, but he gave me hope. And it was always a two-way street, but, you know, we had a lot in common. I, I didn't have a life sentence, but I had to deal with the uh, feelings of, of uh, learned helplessness, uh, shame, and, and um, believing the stories that I had been told about myself and my worth as a human being. And, you know, I had to prove myself wrong, Dan, you know. And you and other people help me understand that it can be a lasting phenomenon, not just a flash in the pan. I'm going to feel better for my about myself for a minute, but then I'm going to go out and do something stupid, you know? Um, well, so, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I, you know, traditional correctional wisdom says that, that ex-con shouldn't, shouldn't interact with other ex-cons that uh you know that, that ex-addicts shouldn't interact with other ex-addicts and so on and so forth there's this as i said world view is, is 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 skewed towards the belief that that it's us versus them but uh in 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 a lot of ways if you use common sense you realize the flaws in that kind of thinking i mean if you take the lifers for example you got somebody who did 30 years in prison next to somebody and while they were in prison you know their families changed people were born people died um uh, you know and but they've developed relationships in prison that are genuine and uh and to to have them come out and say, well, now you can't interact with these people. Well, you know, who are they going to interact? 
You know, are you going to walk up to the cashier at McDonald's and say, hi, my name's Dan. I want to be your friend. Um, so, you know, what happens is, you know, that correctional wisdom fosters loneliness and loneliness is one of the biggest factors in, 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 uh, in going back the other direction because you always have a group that will welcome you back with open arms and that's the people that you used to do crazy stuff with and in fact in many ways they're a bit they're a bit in awe but they're also a bit resentful that you know that you're doing well and and they're not and you know so you you always have a group that will accept you but it's not the group that's going to foster your recovery long term and you know the 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 idea of of each one teach one is common in in a lot of self help groups AA uh, uh, NA uh, you know uh, uh, all the others the A's and the others that exist out mm -hmm. there. but in, in my mind the thing that that makes you sober and continue to be sober and and creates accountability is the fact that you're with people who know what you're going through and there's a certain amount of camaraderie that exists and and you become very close and you look out for each other and uh that's something that a lot of people don't have but and it's something that we got because you know we did something stupid and had to have a foot in our butt but uh, nonetheless, it's something that's very valuable. Uh, you know, I mean, you can look at, at uh, you know, a, a, a good example is 12-step groups. You know, you go through the steps, you go through treatment, you, you know, do a good fourth step and good fifth step and, you know, now go sin no more. And, but that's only the beginning. You know, the other part is continuing to go to groups, continuing to be involved with people who are like you, continuing to uh, to re-experience your things through their things. And, uh, you know, I mean, in in the overall scheme of things, people say what 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 most contributes to recovery, I think it's relationships. And you start out having relationships with the people that 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 were exactly like you and through that you find out that you've got value you know i mean the only value i had as an addict was people thought i was a pretty good thief and for a long time i was the only white kid in south minneapolis that could find marijuana and other drugs uh even at 15 years old and and there's a certain amount of recognition and status that came about of that 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 you teach yourself that that that's that's where your recognition and status comes from, and that's bullshit. And getting sober and interacting with people and being honest with people and making and and having them help you be honest with yourself is, you know, the key to to motivating you to do other things, uh, to do good things. And uh, you know, I mean, I. <laughs> I, I you, you mentioned sarcasm and you know I've got all these little sayings but one is that you know if you go out and you hang out in a barber shop long enough eventually you get a haircut you know other people say well if you if you lay down with dogs you get the you you get fleas well you know the, the other part of that the flip side of that is if you hang out with people that are going in the right direction you know you're motivated to go in that same direction um uh, you know, and, and it's not a matter of, you know, let's go out and evangelize and say, you know, do this and do that. Use my higher power for your higher power and all this kind of stuff. Well, um, you know, it's it's something that if you try and sell me something, you know, I'm going to question it. But if you show me something, you're not going to have to sell me. I'm going to want it and I'm going to want to find out how you got it. Good point. Uh, I heard someone say, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And that probably fits into what you're saying. Um, and I read a book while I was in prison the first time. Um, and it was titled the miracle of forgiveness. And one of the things that I read in there 
that was a takeaway um, that I still practice to this day is, uh, you know, is try to leave something better than I found it, mm -hmm. you know, and I think I'm going to say the G word, but I feel like um, there's no prison wall so thick that God can't get through it, including the prison wall of my shame. And, um, you know, I had to forgive myself for my past behaviors and, um, you know, and accept that maybe I'm, I'm lovable, right? So, and people loved me in the 12-step program, right? When I first showed up, they didn't love my behavior. They didn't love the way I talked. They didn't love some things about me. But, you know, they saw deeper than my ex-convict behavior. I mean, I was still like I was in the, on the block, you know? And um, anger was a survival skill. I cussed more than I actually expressed a genuine idea. And, you know, um, I had a lot of work to do. But yet they just kept saying, um, keep coming back. Gave me handshakes and hugs. And they they didn't say you're an ex-convict. You're, you're, uh, you're a baby killer, you know, because I drove under the influence and I killed the child. Um, they didn't say any of that stuff, you know. And um, and this is going to seem like a random connection. Why am I bothering saying this? But, but I just trust in God's economy. Nothing is wasted. But people in these meetings occasionally would say, well, I just thank God I never drove under the influence and killed someone. And I thought, well, why do you think you're different than me? because of what I did doesn't mean I'm different than you. What I did is different than you, but I'm not different than you. And I've seen men who lost their, their uh, wives and children, lost their marriage, lost their relationships with all the people they loved because of using, whether it's alcohol or drugs. And men in prison who, strong men, who would break down and cry if they knew you in front of you when their wife walked away and their girlfriend got a boyfriend and they couldn't hang out anymore, you know? And uh, to me, I always thought I, I would rather, um, you know, sounds horrible, but I would rather have gone through what I went through than that. And it doesn't mean they're better or worse. It's not a comparison, you know. And and I think removing the comparison is the point that I'm getting at. Is like we look deeper than at each other as human beings to see past the exterior, you know. And uh, and until we've done our inner work, we can't really fix our outer work in the long run, you know. And you talked about the fourth and the fifth step, you know, it's like if you clean out the inside of the cup, then you can go to work cleaning the outside of your life. And um, and after a while, you people start trusting you again, you know, and they see that you're really doing the deal, you know. And it was a great feeling to be trusted with money again after I robbed a store and I got hired in a store, you know. There's minimum wage. Uh, the state was paying half of the income that the store would have paid me otherwise. But somebody in sobriety gave a reference for me and I got in and I wouldn't steal a penny, Dan. I wouldn't take a paper clip, a pen, nothing. Because I, you know, they could trust me more than they could trust someone who had never committed a crime in their entire life. And because um, I had something to prove. I wanted to prove to people that we can change. And I so appreciated a chance to live a different life, you know, and 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 to be trusted again. Man, I, you know, when people trust you when you don't deserve it, you know, sometimes people that love, that need love the most deserve it the least. But man, if we can just love people, we have a chance to get healthy again and I mean constructive love not just like oh I love you and, and give someone a hug and 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 walk away but the long long term commitment that we have to each other 
um, to see the good in each other and to help lift each other up when we're feeling down. To me, the definition of a real friend is someone who takes the time to learn your song and sings it back to you when you forget it, you know? And we all experience grief no matter what. And some, sometimes we need help getting through those hard spots of our lives, you know. But when I look back and I think of the people that would that would really be sad if I went out and did something stupid again, you know, um, I as part of the reason that I want to stay on the path is I, I don't want to, you know what I mean, make other people feel uh, bad that I did something dumb. You know, well, I think you know. You, you know, you talked about how how you could get past. The, I mean, how other people wouldn't respond to your shame. I think in the, in the process, you start realizing that you don't have to respond. It, and you know, in life, we go through situations where we waste a lot of energy on things that have no value. Uh, you mentioned anger. Well, you know, uh, being angry at somebody else, you know, you walk around and, and like I, I've said many times, it's like drinking poison and hoping somebody else dies because, you know, you're walking around with this burden and carrying it and it's getting in the way of all your actions. And the person you're angry at probably doesn't even know it. And uh, the same thing in terms of, of and, and, and they're not, they're certainly not suffering for it. You're suffering for it. And, you know, I mean, learning to forgive yourself is is the key to having other people learn to forgive you. And, and not everybody's going to do that. I mean, uh, I've often said that the people that count in my life are the people that I let know me 100% and then stick around. Because, you know, not everybody's going to. Um, but that's their problem. It's not mine. And once I'm comfortable with myself and comfortable with the people around me, I, I've removed all those negative barriers and feelings that get in my way that occupy my psyche and, and, and jeopardize most of my actions. And I can move forward and do things that, that, that make me happy and stable and and you know hopefully successful yeah if you want you know healthy self-esteem then maybe um you know start with the right mindset and, and um, do esteemable things you know but, then your self-esteem grows but but the other thing and one of the things that 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 we learned in treatment early on is uh you know, I'm, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm probably, you know, I'm a dinosaur in a lot of people's minds, but, you know, if you remember in 1971 and you're probably too young, but there wasn't anybody that held out much hope for heroin addicts. Um, you know, it was, uh, you know, throw them in the spin drive for a while and then wait till they screw up again and do it all over again or put them in prison or hide them away in a nut house somewhere and uh, you know we we kind of came together and found a way to help ourselves with the help of some people that 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 could act as traffic cops for us and um, it's it, it, you know it's grown from there and there were a lot of things that that did, didn't work. I mean, we threw our, a lot of stuff up against the wall because we didn't know any better. And some of it stuck and some of it didn't. And if you look back on some of it, you might say, oh my God. But the bottom line is it created that it's sense of us versus them. Uh, you know, we're going to do it together and we're going to prove people wrong. And we did that. And people started getting sober and people started getting jobs and doing things and, and, you know, being heard. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I still marvel at the fact that I could, uh, that an ex convict and an ex junkie could be the chairman of the sentencing commission, you know, and that was, you know, that was a result of a relationship I developed with Orville Pung and, and people saw what I could do and, and or went to 
Governor Perpich and the chairmanship came open and Perpich said to Orb, who should we appoint? And Orb said, this guy right here. And, you know, then I think I did a, a, an admirable job for the nine years that I was there. And, uh, and, and, and it, it gets back to that each one teach one. You know, today, you know, it's no longer, uh, 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 if you're a heroin addict, you're beyond hope. Uh, we've developed a recovery community out here that, that uh, you know, it's an expectation now that you can get sober. Um, you know, there are, are you know, if, if you... If you're on Facebook or TikTok or whatever, you'll see multiple situations of people uh, talking about their sobriety or, uh, you know, the, there's a group called Against All Odds. It talks about, you know, people that are sober and, uh, you know, it's it's become a sea change that most people don't see because they aren't part of that group and they don't come into contact with that group. But, um, you know, I mean, when I started out, you know, the program that I was in was, you know, 12 to 18 months long. And, you know, it's gotten cut back over time, mostly for financial reasons and, and, and you know, other kinds of things that came along politically. But it, it hasn't really hurt the movement because now there's a recovery community in the world out here that basically extends treatment uh, that, you know, you, you have other people that you can rely on, that you can go to, that understand what you've been through and that can support you moving forward. And you talked about love. Well, you know, love is a lot, love is a complicated term and it, and it takes work. Uh, I mean, even romantic love takes work. You know, I've been married for 30, 32 years now, pretty close. And and it still works. Yeah, I mean, it still takes work. I mean, my wife has to work through my foibles and I've got to work through hers. And, you know, we know where they are now after all this time and we can react to them, but it's it's work. And love not only means hugging people and saying, I love you. It means calling out your bullshit. It means when you're deluding yourself and you're putting on those rose colored glasses and, 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 and we all have them, you know, somebody comes along and says, take those damn things off and look at what's really going on. And, uh, and, and sometimes that can be painful. You know, they talk about tough love. And and the new crop of, of of recovery people. I mean, everybody wants a kinder and gentler recovery. And uh, but the bottom line is, you know, they, they forget that tough love has two parts. And if you only look at the box and you put together something that looks like the picture on the box, you know, you're gonna focus on the tough part when people tell you that you're full of shit, that you're not you know, some lovable character when you're using your, your basically a, a, a pariah and, you know, realizing that and coming to the realization of how the world sees you and how you really are motivates you to become something else. But, but love involves having the wherewithal and caring enough about another person to call out their bullshit that that's that balance with humility and responsibility that i think i was talking about earlier you know the humility is a love but so is the responsibility mm -hmm. you know truth without compassion is cruelty but you still got to give people the truth and you might not say it perfectly you know i had an old man say back in my drinking days said you're not worth a shit to yourself or anybody else and man that hurt you know but it hurt because i thought he was right and, um, you know, and he looked, I can kind of start considering this guy like the dad I never had, you know, and to hear him say that about me, but I still stuck. My my drinking was more important than anything, evidently, you know, because <laughs> I kept doing it. But, um, you know, most of the lessons that have really helped me through the years came from 
a hard push toward the light, you know, and, um, and I feel like I, I remember in prison, I had asked God, say, why are you let me see all this stuff? You know, I mean, I, I just knew about so many really rotten things that human beings were doing, including staff, you know, not just the prisoners, it was both. And we're, we're talking about, I mean, really bad stuff. And uh, it, it kind of made me not want to have trust for another human being ever for any reason. I already grew up without that trust, right? But I, I kept turning that over and say, well, God, you're running my life, you know, even if I'm a, a complete fuck up, um, you know. I, I don't know how to say this right, Dan, because I'm not pushing this God stuff. I'm just, that, that's not my trail, you know? But it's like God loved me when I was fucked up. That's the point I'm making. And if we love each other enough to help each other, you know, in the middle of our, of our fucking up, I guess, you know, and I'm not articulating this well. Maybe this is just where I need your help. But, um, Um, well, God, you know, I mean, first off, God, as we understand him, <laughs> and, you know, that that's a saying from, you know, AA and how people don't, you know, buy into God, but they, they, they have to find a higher power somewhere. And, um, you know, it, it, I mean, I'm of a belief that, that God has a purpose for us. And, um, I, but I'm also of a belief like, um, uh, you know, I have friends, I have friends that would talk about God, you know, six days a week and, or, or, or one day a week and go out and steal the other six. And, you know, I'd tell them you're full of shit. You know, you, you know, you have to, to, to 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 you know if if you're gonna talk about God, then you have to pay attention to what He expects from you or she expects from you, and um, you know, and and people come along and they they invariably try and tell you that your relationship with God should be the same as their relationship with God, and uh, you know, to me, religion is just politics disguised as as somebody's idea of god's intent for them and i'm not somebody who tries to read god's mind and i'm also of the opinion that you know i've got a lot of friends and relationships and every one of them's different and they're all valuable and i think well if if i've got the ability to maintain multiple relationships god is infinitely more capable than I am so he can have different relationships with each one of us and that's okay and in fact to say that it's not okay is really discounting God you know uh, I, I don't have to be the same spiritual person that you are and in fact if you tell me I have to you know that's a little bit arrogant and a little bit um you know uh, narcissistic if you will that that you know but but the bottom line is you're here for a purpose and if you think in terms of what makes you feel good what makes you feel accepted what makes you feel successful whatever that might be you know it invariably are the things that we think of in terms of um uh, you know, whether it's the Ten Commandments or the Two Commandments, you know, love your neighbor and love your God. Well, if you do those two, you can't do the other ten. Uh -huh, and, there you, go. you know, it's it, it's it, it's it's simple, but we complicate it. And we complicate it, you know, sometimes because people have a need to belong to something. Uh, sometimes we complicate it because of greed and self-centeredness and whatever but you know if i don't think god appreciates that but again i'm not one to read his mind but um you know it it, it the, the thing that you can't overlook is you're here 
when by all intents and purposes you shouldn't be. You know, I mean, I look at the past 50 years and even with the hard times, it's all gravy. You know, I, I mean, my friend Jerry that we talked about, he said, well, you know, all I want is a, to be free and be able to look out the window at the birds and the bees and have a dog and, you know, a small apartment, a food to eat and all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, he got all those things and then he wanted more and, and he went out and got more, but he didn't get it by stealing it. He didn't get it by manipulating people he just got it by standards that have been set eons ago and uh, you know i mean one of the greatest joys in my life uh, was the fact that that jerry when he died um, had seven years sobriety and was was given back to other people and uh you know, whatever small part I played in that, um, you know, I, I, I'm very proud of. But, you know, we used to sit because he was homeless for a while because, you know, as a, as a 67, 68-year-old man, there wasn't a lot of physical things that he could do. He had COPD um, and there aren't a lot of affordable housing programs that will rent to a first-degree murderer. And so he stayed with me for three or four months and we would sit out back and he'd smoke cigars or cigarettes and I'd smoke cigars and we'd, you know, chat and solve all life's problems. And he used to say, you know, I think my COPD and I think my other kinds of challenges that I have physically and, and, uh, our punishment for all the things that I did in life. And I say, God, don't work like that. You know, God, God is, is loving you as you are now. Um, and, you know, he's not one for retribution in my mind. And, uh, you know, you have to, you have to forgive yourself and then recognize that God forgives you too. That was like one of the most huge things in my life when um, I heard this woman, Mary Jo Robinson, speak when I saw her 90 days. Um, and she persuaded me to work on forgiving myself when I, and I wouldn't have respected even that idea from anyone in the same way, except for she had forgiven the person that killed her son drunk driving. And I told her, I, you know, killed someone's son drunk driving. And, and she says, I've got to get you out there speaking. And I didn't want to do it. But she persuaded me, you know, she said, when we're asked to do service work in recovery, we don't say no. And secondly, what if you help somebody? It's basically saying it's not all about you and how you feel about yourself, you know. So what about the people you can help? And uh, so it's like I, I couldn't say no to that. And I said, oh, I'll try. Um, but she actually hugged the person that killed her son and said, I love you and I forgive you because that's what we do in recovery recovery and she was her tradition was a christian tradition she said they teach it there too you know every every religion worth its salt you know talks about love and forgiveness and and forgiving people when it's really difficult that's when it's worth it you know forgiving someone for the little stuff that's easy you know and the thing that I never saw coming is that the woman whose child I killed actually stepped forward and we became friends. And she said she loves and forgives me. And I never thought I'd hear that from her because I sought it for a while, but I, I had to let go of it. And I, by the time she was ready to do that, I had already forgiven myself for what I had done. But it was after eight years of speaking for Mothers Against Drunk Driving and wanting to kill myself after speaking. Felt good while I was doing it, Dan. But afterwards, I'd be alone. I just want to crash my car into a tree or a bridge 100 miles an hour and just prove how sorry I was for the for that, you know? And uh, But, you know, staying alive is harder than killing yourself. It requires a lot of work. It's like being in a relationship. You talked about how, you know, being in a relationship can be difficult, even if it's been for a long time. Um, 
And it's like, if you don't want to grow up, stay the fuck out of a relationship, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, because these things make us grow if we just stick it out, no matter how hard it gets. And, And forgiving myself was one of the hardest things I've had to do in my entire life. And I've had a couple of harder things because I'm still alive. I've experienced a couple of more difficult things. Um, but that was one of, that's pretty far up there, you know? And um, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for the relationship I have with her now. She's sent me a bunch of photographs of her, her son that I killed, her his baby pictures. He's six months six months old when um, when this happened, you know. So, um, and I use those pictures in my presentations, you know. But here's the thing that no one would ever guess. But she said, Timothy, you know, I think you're one of the best things that's ever happened to me in my entire life. And who would have thought that a mom would ever say that about? person that killed her kid she also said that that was the most mo- painful moment she's had in her entire life she also said that you know and um but man you just never know what's going to grow out of uh walking a path of of service and love for other people and and i was one of those oddballs where you know most people have to love themselves before they can love someone else I had to love others until, you know, I, until uh, it's like I could love others, but I couldn't love myself. I just had it was the opposite for me. And and I slowly but surely saw the, the rewards of what I was doing. And I started to believe people when they said, you you know, you uh, this is not narcissism when I say this, but they'd say, I think you saved my life, you know. And I've always said, if you don't tell three people a day that you love them, you probably wasted a day of your life. But, you know, saying I love you in the middle of feeling like a piece of shit it is not always easy. But I did it anyway, you know. And then when it when I saw that it paid off and people were saying, you saved my life, one guy was going to commit suicide until he heard me say I love you. And he looked at me and there's this human being in front of me saying that he loves me. And it was at the right time. It's not about me. It's about the right timing. It's not what you do. It's when you do it sometimes, you know, but whatever it is, you just do it. And uh, for some people saying I love you is harder than two years of work to prove it because they don't want to say it. It's just too hard, you know. So we're all different. Um, But one thing's for sure. It might not be easy, but it's damn well worth it, you know. And I do love you, my friend. I love, I you love too. the I love the work you've done and the work you're doing. And uh even on your boring days, you know. <laughs> I think uh Metallica, uh, the lead singer Metallica said boredom comes from a boring mind. We can always change our mind, you know. So <laughs> um but you I'm gonna just I'm sorry to go on a bit much here, but I just have been um wanting to say this quote by Mark Twain. When you're talking about people that go to church on, on Sunday and then live the six other days of the week uh, with a needle in their arm or something. But um, I'm paraphrasing. But uh, Mark Twain was was actually at church on a Sunday. And afterwards, he reported an old woman who approached him and just read him the riot act. He, you know, she said, you know, you're such a hypocrite. You been out there gallivanting on the river boats and you're smoking cigars and you're drinking bourbon and you're cussing all the time and you're hanging around with those loose women and you know you're such a hypocrite going to church on Sunday and you know and he said well ma'am how would you like me if I didn't go to church on Sundays you think I'm bad now (laughs) you know you know so he I think the point of that is that he used humor. He used humor to um, deal with the criticism that other people throw at us. And, and you know, um, sometimes it's laugh to keep laugh to keep from crying, you know. And it's a tool I learned in prison. Use laughter to deal with stuff, not just to cover up the insecurities and be fake, but fake it till you make it. Don't be fake, but fake it till you make it, you know. And... Um, 
but if you could share one piece of uh, your your experience, strength, and, and hope with somebody who's maybe listening to this podcast today who is struggling with, uh, you know, active addiction, whether it's crack or, or whatever, uh, it doesn't, to me, a drug is a drug is a drug. I, my drug of choice was uh, alcohol. And I never had a problem quitting the other stuff, but I could quit drinking. So whatever, the one that, that you had trouble getting over, uh, you know, and, and whether it's heroin or drinking, you know, to me, it was all the same thing. We don't judge each other's drug of choice as being harder or easier. It's just our, our lives all look different on the outside, but the inside stuff. But what would you say to somebody right now who's really struggling and they're saying, fuck, I can't do this. Can't do this anymore. Because if they're still listening at the end of this hour, you know, that's pretty powerful stuff. What you got? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think the the message is that if I can do it and you can do it, anybody can do it. But I, I had this friend one time who, who said, you know, well, you know, things are different now. I said, well, things are different, but people are pretty much the same. And he said, yeah, but in your day, you know, the heroin was, you know, if if you're lucky, 10% pure. And now it's, you know, 30, 40% pure and whatever. And I said, so you're going to sit here and argue with me about who is the shiniest turd in the bowl. <laughs> And reminds me of know, politics. <laughs> and, and and it's and 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 that's because you know you think that that's the one thing that you have to hold on to that makes you valuable or worthwhile. And think about how fucked up that is. You know, uh, you know, and, and I said, truth be told, because heroin was, you know less pure back then that just meant that i had to steal more so i guess i was a better thief than you were but that's you, were, you worked harder at getting 30 percent heroin exactly in system. <laughs> exactly but it but it's but but it, it, if you think about the stupidity of making that kind of argument and it comes from people who think well this is all i've got this is what i this is this is you know, like I said, when I used to be a thief, I didn't see myself as a scumbag or, or somebody who would steal from their, you know, their, their wife or their kids or their grandkids. I saw myself as Jack Sparrow, who was some kind of, you know, scalawag that was lovable and just misunderstood and really didn't need to change. The world just needed to change to understand him better. Well, that was bullshit, but that was what I had to hang on to. I had people who liked me for the show, who liked the fact that, you know, that I could do some things that they couldn't do or make some contacts that they couldn't do. And it was what you hung on to, you know, to, to get what little self-worth you could have. And until you rip that Band-Aid off, you know, until you take a look at, at you know, who you are, um, you know, you're hanging on to that crumb of of uh, of what you consider respectability. Well, you got to let that go, because like I said, you know, I, I'm, and this is not politically correct, but a friend of mine said, you know, well, you're sitting there arguing about who's the tallest midget. And, uh, you know, it's it's something that, you know, you, until you acknowledge who you are, you can't become somebody else. I mean, any problem has to be defined before it can be solved. But the bottom line is there's a solution out there. And if and if I can find it as fucked up as I was, and you can find it as fucked up as you were, then the options, the opportunities are infinite. Amen to that, man. Well, folks, I appreciate your tuning in to the Incomplete Skeptic Sober Wise Guy series. And Dan, I want to thank you for coming on the show, man, and helping us spread some good news out there, you know. And, and uh, maybe we touched a heart today, you know. You just never know where this stuff's going. And and you know what? I this this might sound like uh, like 
darkness, but it's not. It's like someday someone's going to want to hear our voice. We're not going to live forever. And right now, our conversation is something that people can tune in and they say, oh, man, I miss Dan's voice. Man, I miss Timothy's voice. Well, you know what? You can go back and listen to this sometime. And uh, so every time we leave our voice in somebody's hearts, man, you know, that that's what it's all about. And, uh, so thank you for showing up, my brother. We'll catch you on the rebound or we'll see you at Full Circle Advisory Committee here next Monday and uh, we'll keep doing the deal. Thank Thanks you. for tuning in. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate you very much. And...